afternoon, everyone. I'm Lee Altness, Vice Commodore of the Inland Lake Yachting Association. Today, we will uh, continue in our series of educational webinars with Steph Robel and Maggie Shea, uh, while they're continuing to prepare for the 2021 uh, Olympic Games. So I'd like to thank all of our IOI sponsors, the IOI Foundation for the grant that made the funding possible for this series. And I'd especially like to thank our partner Salesing uh, for helping us capture all of this material and putting it online. So visit salesing.com or ilya.org to learn more about that. So why don't I hand it over to uh, Steph and Maggie and we'll get going. Cool, thank you very much, Lee. And thank you to IOA and Salesing for making this opportunity possible. And thank you to all of you for tuning in. Um, downwind is really, really fun in our boat. So we're excited to talk with you guys about some of the things we've learned. And um, yeah, hopefully you guys can uh, take something away until your summer racing. Um, we have a lot of youth sailors here with us tonight um, and a lot of intermediate sailors. So welcome everyone of all ages. All right, so we'll get this started um, talking about priorities for the downwind. Um, we, we really like to keep things simple on our boat. Um, we, so for in light air, medium air, and heavy air, we have different priorities. Um, in light air, wind is the most important factor. A little bit of puff can make a really big difference in your speed. Um, and then clean lanes are really important as well. Um, as you'll find out, both those things make a big difference, no matter the wind strength, but they're extra important in light air. Um, and then in medium air, we focus a lot on shifts and speed, boat speed. Um, in heavy air, it's all about boat handling, just making sure you keep your, your mass pointing the right direction. Um, and then we'll talk about a little bit about priorities based on the day. So um, we, in our first webinar together, we talked about different priorities upwind um, based on the type of day, and they changed as well for downwind. So if we have a really shifty and puffy day, the most important thing to think about is getting in the most amount of pressure on the race course and then getting on the headed jive. And then if you have a really steady, steady day, like you're sailing in big open water, then you're focusing on boat speed and having a clear lane um, on, the, on the long jive. Um, and then if you have somewhere to race to, you would race to that feature. So let's say you're there's more wind clearly on one side of the race course, you, you try to race to that side of the race course. So just a couple, a quick reminder to talk about, you know, different priorities for the type of day and wind strength, um, just some good rules of thumb to keep in your back pocket. Um, and then next, we uh, just want to talk about how we divide the run into thirds. So the first third of the the lure, or the first third of the downwind, we think about the windward mark exit. So setting yourself up so you have a strong exit from the windward mark and you're not covered in bad air and you have good, good boat speed, all those things. And we'll get into that in a little bit. Um, and then the second third, we're talking about speed and lanes and shift manage and shift and puff management. So um, that's more where we focus into our speed section. Um, and then the bottom third, we think about that lured mark approach. So that's kind of how we simplify things um, for the different parts of the race course and different priorities. Um, and I'm gonna kick it over to Maggie, who's gonna talk more about that windward mark exit. Yeah, so real quick, before we go on to that, I just wanna clarify um, one way that Steph and I communicate. We talk about the left side of the course. Um, Steph, am I showing the right screen? Yes. Okay, cool. Um, the left side of the course, is always the left side of the course, whether we're going upwind or downwind. And we say it like course left. So when we're sailing downwind and we refer to the left side or course left or better breeze on the left, we're always talking about left as if it's like, like a compass direction, you know, like it's always left, no matter which way you're looking on that race course on that day. And same goes for the right side. So we call it like course left and course right. And we're always talking about as if you were looking upwind. You can change it differently on your boat, do whatever works for you. Um, sometimes people like to say like shore side, offshore side, you know, inshore, offshore. Um, but yeah, we just want to let you know that's throughout the presentation, we'll refer to like course left. And that means this left side of the race course or this course right, this right side. But then when we talk about gates, we switch it up just to confuse you. <laughs> no, I'm kidding. <laughs> then we talk about making a right-hand turn or left-hand turn. 
And so in that situation, that's facing downwind because you're talking about the turn that you'll make. Um, so this would be, uh, my, I hope my cursor is showing here. This yep. would be the course, this would be the left gate, you know, the course left gate. You'd round this to go to the left side, but it would take a right hand turn to get there and vice versa. This mark is on the right side of the course, but it takes a left hand turn to go that way. Make sense? All right, my job's done. Take it away, Steph. <laughs> <laughs> Clear. Yeah. I thought you were talking about when remark stuff. <laughs> yeah, yeah, okay, okay. So, um, we talked earlier in a lot of webinars about um, what, this concept called tactical intelligence. And really the bottom line of that is that throughout the day of racing, you're trying to learn faster than the other people about that race course, right? You're just trying to gather more information and slowly draw better conclusions and hone your understanding as the day goes on. And so in order to do that, you have to be able to ask yourself, well, what do I think is gonna happen? What did happen? Was what I thought happened, or was what I thought correct? You know, Or did something else happen? Or do we not know what happened? Um, and all of those things are important to understand if you are making good guesses and good choices. Um, but uh, one really important check-in point is at the windward mark because Ideally, you've got a game plan for your upwind. So say we wanted to go to the course right, and then we go to the course right. Once we get to the top mark, we should ask, hey, did the right side work? Or did the left side work? Or um, do we not know? Or did packs from both sides come in together? So it's all really important information. And that's when this, this, this whole conversation happens. It's right, going into the windward mark, it's not like where this picture is taken. You know, it's not usually when our bow's at the mark we start talking about it. It's usually when you have a moment to breathe and you're a few boat lengths away at least. And um, you ask, okay, what worked? Was the course skewed? You know, if it's, a, if it's a perfectly square course, you should spend the same amount of time on starboard as you did on port. But if you didn't, then ask yourself, okay, was it skewed? If so, which leg, or which, you know, did I spend more time on starboard or on port? And then remember, it's gonna be the opposite on the downwind. Um, and that's important because one really easy game plan and like fallback default plan, if you don't know what to do, you just want to spend a lot of time on the long board, right? So Steph will talk a little more in a few uh, slides about what that means, but just think about, okay, did I spend more time on port up or starboard upwind? And then just remember, it's going to be the opposite when you go downwind. Okay. And then also, um, where are we in the fleet? Are we in last place? Are we in first place? Are we somewhere in the middle? You know, and, and answering that question helps you understand if you are on offense or defense, you know, so if you're winning, you're generally on defense. If you're in the top three, you're generally on defense. You're pretty happy where you are, and that's where you want to finish. But if you're in the back of the pack, you're pretty much on offense to everyone. And so you're thinking, okay, I might have to take some risks here. I might jibe set if no one else does. I'm looking for opportunities to do something different and get around the boats in front of me. So that's the question. Those are the questions we asked. What worked well upwind? Was the course really skewed? And where am I in the fleet? And just real quick, what, what else might you do? Like, right, at, if you're getting to this position that we're in in this photo, what else might you just take a, what, what else might you do? Any, any thoughts from the audience? We have yeah, a, a what are you check. Doing this weekend? <laughs> what are you doing this weekend? <laughs> what else might you do? Think about what worked and what didn't work on the, on the, um, fleet and what is history, but we also have to think about what's coming at us, right? So what else might you do before you round the windward mark? <laughs> okay. Any thoughts? Hint, it rhymes with mun trolls. <laughs> Interesting. <that. laughs> I was thinking, uh, take a look up wind, look up wind for upcoming, yes, yeah. for upcoming guests. See, my job is to get the controls off. So I'm setting the, the <laughs> sail up for downwind. Yeah. Thinking cool. wide and tight. You're thinking about what kind of rounding? Totally. Yeah. So find that first puff. Look for a good lane. Nice. Love it. Yeah, that first puff coming downwind is super critical. So right before you round the winter mark, take a look upwind and look at what's coming down for that first part of the run. I like it. Thanks, guys. So, um, hmm, 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 hmm. Sorry, interesting animation. Okay, so if we decided that we liked the course left side of the race course and the left side worked, um, we're likely going for a straight exit around the winter mark, which is this line here. Basically, you round, head downwind, and just keep sailing straight, um, as opposed to jiving. So let's talk about the straight exit. One advantage is that it's generally 
little lower risk. Um, and you're not jiving or underneath uh, the bad air of the boats that are stacking up on the starboard lay line. You are generally speaking going with the majority of the fleet. So if you're in front, it's, it's usually a pretty conservative, safer bet. Um, and a straight exit is good if there's a lot of traffic and congestion. If there's like a big jam up on the ley line, if there are a bunch of boats coming in on port, um, just sailing straight for a few boat lengths and getting clear of that is usually the safest option. Okay, but a jive exit, like Steph was saying, if that first puff looks like it's on the course right side, or say you got a really nice puff on ley line, then the jive exit might be sweet. Um, there's a little higher risk involved, especially on the first leg, because on the first upwind leg of a race, the boats are generally a lot closer together. And so there's a lot more congestion, there's a lot more bad air, and there are a lot, there are a lot more boats weaving in and out, right? It feels like everyone gets to the windward mark at the, first, at the same time, maybe within 10 seconds. But on the second leg, the jibe exit is a little less risky because usually there's a little more separation between the boats. And so if you're doing really well, just consider the amount of risk on the first leg doing a jibe set. Um, and, and in theory, that should go down throughout the race. And then the options open rounding is one that I like because if your answer to the question of what worked upwind is, I'm not really sure, then that's like when the skipper's head goes on a swivel and is like, I'm gonna find that first puff, I'm gonna find that first puff, right Steph, that's all you do. And you're just like yeah. looking out, you're aggressively trying to figure out who's gaining, who's got the most breeze, who's hiking the hardest, who's trapping, whose boat looks like they're moving fast. And we gotta keep our options open so that we could jive if we see something over there. Um, and, and the important part about that is that um, if you're sailing a double-handed boat cruise, like help your skipper keep your bow free. That's what we say on our boat, bow free so that we can jive. That means like not getting locked on one side or another of the boat that we're sailing next to, um, that's directly in front of us. So it, it's options open is like, be ready for anything. <laughs> might be a jive, might be a jive set, might be a set straight, might be a set then jive, but just, uh, yeah, on your toes. Cool. Does anyone have any questions about anything we've talked about so far? I really like this discussion that we had on the US sailing team webinar when we talked about top marks because some skippers said that at every single top mark they ask the question, is it a jibe set or a straight set? And uh, some skippers were like, well, we don't need to have that discussion every single time and the default is a straight set and it's okay to have it as default. And some people chimed in and said, well, if you don't have the question every single time, then you, <laughs> Do you think of something, Lucas? <laughs> if you don't ask the, have the conversation every time, then you risk not asking the question that one out of 10 times that it is the right option. And so some people think that's really important. All right, Lucas, what's your question? <laughs> the suspense is building, I like that. <laughs> well, we'll wait for that one to trickle in. Uh, <laughs> yeah. In the meantime, Oh, he doesn't have one. <laughs> oh. Just some commentary. I like it. Um, cool. So just a quick reminder for everyone. Upwind, we want to make sure we're sailing the lifted tack all the time. Downwind, we want to make sure we're sailing the headed jive. Um, so definitely opposite downwind. And just, just like we talked about last week with the upwind tactics, you want to sail the jive that's going to point your bow closest to the mark. So awesome diagram from Sail Zing here. You can see very easily the difference between the yellow and green boat, um, assuming that you know, the mark is straight ahead. That yellow boat is able to sail, point their bow a lot closer to the mark. Whereas if you sail the lifted jibe, you're going to be sailing extra distance um, on the downwind. But then that gets into the question of how do you know if you're lifted or headed? So we have these handy dandy telltales and windexes. Who, who uses telltales, who uses Windexes? I know if you sail an Opti, you won't be able to use telltales because you don't have shrouds, but if you sail an X-boat, you would be able to. So I'm curious to hear from everyone if they already use them um, or not. And um, we'll get into a little bit more about how, how to use them right here. So I think the um, telltales on, yeah, wind indicator, nice. Guys, let me tell you a little secret while your answers are coming in. Okay. Steph loves this wind indicator so much. There's no proper way to fix it on our boat. We use what's called Gorilla Tape. Duct tape. Like, we duct tape it to the top of our mast. That's how important we think it is. Yeah. It doesn't fit in in any fancy way. We spend time making like 
every everything else on our boat really aerodynamic and really spiffy. And then this thing, we're like, it's that important, we're gonna duct tape it. And we're the only ones in the fleet that use one, and we don't care that we look like dorks because it <laughs> works and it is so helpful. So yeah, so a uh, Windex or um, telltales on your shrouds are really helpful for helping you identify um, a shift. So um, we actually have a little game after this slide that we're going to talk some more about that, but um, it'll help you understand if you're getting lifted or headed. Um, and it also, the telltales also help you with lane management, which if you're sailing in a big fleet like at the inlands or a big Octi regatta, um, this will help you with um, knowing if you're sailing in clean air. So if you, if the tell, if the, if you're ahead and you want to know if someone behind you is affecting your wind, look at their wind indicator. And if their wind indicator is look is pointing at your boat, then you're in their bad air. That's the easiest way to think about it. Cool. So a lot of wind pennants and telltales. That's awesome to hear from you guys. Um, and just keeping it simple, remembering it points to where your um, apparent wind is coming from and uh, how you can cover another boat. So next slide, Maggie. We're gonna play a little game called Lifted, Headed, Puff or Lull, and What Should You Do? <laughs> so here we have um, a telltale that rotates towards the bow and droops slightly less, so it, it, it flares up a bit. Um, is it lifted, headed, and is it a puff or lull? And what should you do? Is that your inside one? Yes. Okay. Your windward one. Lucas says head in. Cool. So if the, I'm going to reveal the answer here, unless anyone else wants to chime in real quick. Avery and Mason say head in. Nice. That's correct. So if you're, Sorry. Um, so if you're, if the telltale goes forward, that means that you're, you've been headed. Um, and then the, the change is that um, because it's drooping slightly less, it means that you're in more wind. So being able to recognize that is really important. Um, next slide. Okay. So let's say the telltale goes toward the bow, but droops more. Any thoughts here? <laughs> Steph, can you explain the diagram a little more in more detail? Yep, so we have the, the, the straight line and the dotted line. Um, it does, I can, I see how that is a little confusing. Can puzzle, sorry guys. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, so I think the big thing here is that a, a change happened in the sense that the, um, the telltale drooped a little bit. So what does that mean? Okay, good answer. So if the telltale droops, that means you have less wind to keep it flying. So you might have just sailed into a lull. So if you sailed into a lull, then you would you would head up a little bit to build speed. Does that make sense? Still confuzzled. <laughs> we'll talk a little bit more about the diagram, I think. Yeah, so we have the, the telltale that, um, so the telltale rotates, it actually rotates back here. So you can see the, the wind actually moves forward to make the telltale fly straighter back. So that would mean you're headed. If it, if it points more from this, if it, um, if it blows forward, that means that you're um, getting lifted. If the telltale blows back, that means you're getting headed. And I'm sorry, the text does not match what I just said. So let's imagine, let's imagine I'm on a bicycle and I have a telltale in my hand and there's no wind. That telltale would stream directly backwards, right? Yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> okay. So that telltale will stream directly backwards. And then say all of a sudden it starts becoming really windy from my side. 
what happens to that telltale? It was going backwards towards me and now it changes direction a little bit, right? Because it's influenced by the puff, the puff on my left side. So where the telltale is streaming is a combination of the direction your, the, your boat is moving and where the puffs are coming from. And so Steph, when you're saying the puff comes from more in front of like uh, closer to your bow, that telltale is gonna stream further back instead of, um, yeah, it, it, so when you're sailing along, let's pretend your telltale is streaming like 45 degrees back or something like that. And then all of a sudden it starts streaming directly back towards you where you're sitting as a skipper. That would be a header because the direction of the wind went forward. Does that make sense? It starts sli going slightly to the side. Yeah, here, let's check out the next diagram. Sort of, okay, we're getting sort of, we're making progress. Okay. <laughs> it's kind of a tough thing to visualize, to be honest, when, when we're not like sitting on a boat together. <laughs> um, we're talking about the, the telltale on a, on a shroud and it's rotating like this, right? Is that correct? Okay. Yeah. So this is the shroud and then my hand is a telltale. <laughs> Maybe let's go back to a couple of these. So the, the, the diagram is confusing because the, the, so the silver part is the, <laughs> the silver part is the boat and the blue line is the, <laughs> the shroud or the backstay. Um, and so that's, you're kind of at like a bird's eye view here, if that helps. So if the telltale um, rotates, in this scenario, the, the, the arrow is pointing the telltale to be further back um, to my eye, and that would mean that we are headed. Yeah, so in, maybe instead of thinking about you're headed, you could also think about the, the wind direction has now started coming from closer to your bow instead of over your side. And then therefore, because it's coming closer to the bow instead of over your side, you need to head down, so you're headed. Sometimes, like, sometimes spinnaker trimmers will talk about, like, pressure coming from over their shoulder, like, over my left shoulder, or it's coming from in front of us. And so if it's coming, you know what I mean, and, and the wind direction is moving back and forth as we're going downwind, kind of from the side, and then kind of a little more from the front instead of the side, and then a little more from the back instead of the side. And then it comes from the side, and then it goes a little more in front, and then a little more in back. And so say the, say the telltale does the opposite thing. Do we have a lift in here? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay, so telltale, I see the confusion. So the, say the telltale was blowing from your side and then all of a sudden the, the back end of the telltale starts flying closer to where the bow is. So the wind is coming from more behind you instead of from in front of you. What would that be? Avery, Mace. Looks like we have some light bulbs going off here. <laughs> I love this chat, guys. You're the best for chatting. <laughs> So in this scenario, if the, the telltale rotates forward, um, then you have a, a lift. Exactly. <laughs> Good one, Avery Mason. Yep. So it's the back of the telltale that rotates forward, which means the wind is now coming from more of our back instead of from the front. So it's coming now from the back more. And because of that, we have to head up. And then that's called a lift. Cool. Sorry for any confusion there, guys. I know it's a little bit it, it, now that hopefully you guys can see it now that we have the, the silver lines as the boat. Um, and we're happy to answer any more questions you guys might have. But paying it, I guess the, the point here is to pay attention to how, how much your telltale is flying. So like if it's quite droopy, then you're probably in a lull and you should be looking around for um, more pressure. If it's flying really well, it means you're in really good pressure. Lift, so a couple lift, good questions. Lifted like um, Jude asked, lift like airfoil or lifted like um, lifted like a change in direction. Yeah. Okay. So back to this slide, we generally use the word lifted to mean heading closer to the direction of the wind, and headed to mean heading farther from the direction of the wind. So going upwind it's a positive thing because you can point closer to where the wind is coming from, but going downwind, 
being lifted means you're heading closer to where the wind is coming from, but that's the opposite direction of where you're trying to go. And so it's kind of confusing because lifted downwind is bad and lifted upwind is good. But um, a lift in general means you're sailing at a closer angle to where the wind comes is coming from, the wind direction is coming from, and headed means you're sailing at a wider angle. Does that make sense? Cool. And Caroline, I, to answer your question, is the telltale always 90 degrees to the wind? Um, not always, but that's a pretty good, like, general starting place. Like, on our boat, we have to be going really fast to get our apparent wind in front of 90 degrees to our boat. So I'd actually say that's, like, in general, it, well, and, and that's actually pretty far forward. I think of where the majority of the scows sail. Like, scows will sail more dead down wind. So, because you're going dead downwind, the wind is coming from directly behind you, and so your telltale should be further back than that 90 degrees. Yeah. But basically, it doesn't necessarily matter like where that starting point is of your telltales, but what Steph was really showing in those other diagrams was the changes in the telltale's direction is what indicates to you that the wind has shifted and now the puff is coming from more over your back or more in front of you. And that's what you can kind of, that's what you want to pay attention to in the change of it. And the other cool thing that those, di those diagrams point out is that when the telltale is either streaming like this or like drooping, you know, and a droopy telltale can tell you that your sail's not trimmed properly or you're not heading in the right way, or it can also tell you that there's less wind, right? And so that's what the, the drooping more, drooping less, drooping slightly, that's what that was getting into. So there's a lot of stuff to pay attention to in telltales, like, the direction that they're head they're changing uh and then how far they're flying and then you're trying you know um it's it's just another piece of information that can help you become aware that shifts are happening change yeah yeah cool guys thanks for the questions really appreciate it that's a tough concept to to teach over a webinar so we really appreciate the engagement <laughs> you got a lot of yaddy karate going on now yeah okay so now we've talked about the top of the course, and now we want to talk about the middle of the, the downwind. Um, and like Steph said earlier, it's a lot of speed and lane management. So we want to talk about um, bad air. Okay, probably going to get some yachty karate on this topic too. But we we looked at a lot of bad air diagrams, and we liked this one the most because it showed how the direction that you're heading really changes where you're casting your bad air shadow where you're casting your blanket you know and blocking the wind so in this diagram on the left like that would be you're basically just blocking the wind right uh from someone that's like to lure of you the wind is coming from the top of the top of the screen just always um and this one this is the slow zone because a you're kind of blocking the wind in some of this but also there's like some backwash off your sail basically you can kind of think about it like backwash like prop wash in the water or something you know it's also just bad air there's a little bit lesser and there's bad air there's like this yeah better and then same thing when you're going upwind this red stuff this is like the wind is blocked and then this yellow stuff is like it's it's some backwash almost you're like in someone's prop wash okay so um, we want to look at this diagram on the right and chat who you think has the worst air on the course right now. And there might be multiple answers. So A, B, C, D, and E are all sailing downwind. And actually all those boats we're talking about are on port. It's kind of hard to see, but who do you think has like really bad air? Okay, we have a B, a D, a B, and A. B, D, B, A. Okay. Nice. Like it. Good job. Yeah, I agree. I think that none of them are in perfectly clean air. Totally. And that they'd be in like kind of a, either a blanket zone, like D might actually not have any good wind at all. They might be like stopping the water. Um, B is probably in like somewhat of that slow zone with some of the backwash, you know, uh, and A probably a combination of two. Yeah, totally. Okay, cool. Who do you guys think has like the cleanest air on the course? I would say there's probably one answer to this one. E, C. Okay, E's and C's. Hmm. I would say E has the cleanest, but I agree with everyone that C probably also has cleaner. Yeah. I would wonder, and it probably depends on like real life how close this pack is here on the right, 
but how close this pack is might be affecting C a little bit. Um, if they're far enough away, then you guys are right. C is free and clear. Oh, I see. You guys are probably thinking because the wind is coming from in here. Got it. So Steph and I also happen to know that these boats sail really fat angles when it's light air. And so that's kind of in the back of our mind too, that um, I think some of this batter might be good affecting C because I think their apparent wind would be coming from this area. So yeah, I would say generally speaking, C and E are probably looking good. If they're reaching, just remember if you're reaching, their air is coming from like this zone. And if you're going dead downwind, then it's coming from this zone. So we did have a little bit inside information knowing that they're reaching around. And so there are more errors more coming from here. But if they all went down to a dead run, you're right, C would be clear and cleanest and E would be affected by C. Okay, we got a Margo C. At what times do you sail super high downwind or when you bear, bear down and try to sail the shortest distance? Okay, so that's a good question. When do we sail reach at a reaching angle and when do we sail at like a running angle? Um, and, and let's look at these boats over here. I would say this boat on the left is on a run and this boat here is closer to like a beam reach. And so the angles we sail depend on the wind speed. Um, when it's really light, we tend to reach around. And then when it's, fat, when it's heavier, we start going a lot faster when we're reaching. So the faster we go, then actually the lower we can point. And so we start getting closer to this running angle. But our boats have um, asymmetrical spinnakers, which means that we are constantly trying to just go faster and faster and faster and then take that speed down when we have it. Whereas I think like an X boat with the whisker pull, is that right, Steph, on mm -hmm. the jib? Um, you guys are more often sailing dead downwind but then you have to ask yourself like, how much faster am I gonna go if I reach and how much extra distance is that gonna cost me? Um, so I don't know the wind speed threshold, but it's definitely something you can work on in practice and you can do it by saying, okay, we're gonna sail down wind. We actually do stuff like this on the FX all the time. We say, okay, you guys double trap and we're not gonna trap, you know? And then we see the difference after a minute. Um, and we both sail our boats as fast as we can. And then it's pretty clear after a minute of sailing on the same board, not affecting each other's breeze, who's gone better. And so I, I definitely, I wish I could give you a perfect answer on that reach versus run in an expo, but I think it's something you actually have to experiment with um, in practice and figure out. So go ahead, Steph, are you gonna? I was gonna say like, just in general, um, take, if you hit a lull, take your, point your bow up a little bit to build speed. If you hit a puff, you can build the speed and then bring um, your bow down a little bit. So. Um, up in the puffs, down in the lulls, and it's a, it's a boat feeling thing. So if your boat um, has really good pressure, like you have good pressure in the main sheet, you have good pressure in the helm, then you can take that, that speed down a little bit. Um, but as soon as you hit a lull or the speed starts to run out, then you would bring your, your bow back up a little bit. Does that make sense? Is there a good yeah, when you ask about if there's a good trick to determine the best VMG, Honestly, um, even on our boat, we just sail, we do tuning runs with other boats. Um, if you're talking about what angle is the best to sail and it's constantly changing, right? So it's actually, the modes are, um, we distinguish between how much direction change Steph makes, you know, in the, in the condition that we go a lot, a lot faster when we head up, then we make more direction changes. And then the conditions that we don't go any faster heading up, then we make very little direction changes. Let's maybe come back to this later because we actually want to talk about speed next week. And so yeah. I think this is a lot about speed stuff. Um, but we want to get some tactical discussions. So um, Margo, these are great questions, but we will come back to this. Um, okay, so I just wanted to talk about this. If we actually go back one lane, um, we see that these some lanes have really good wind, some lanes don't have great wind, some lanes people are really gonna have to deal with a lot of traffic pretty soon. And so we like to think about this in terms of like, what's the best lane that we can get coming back in the middle of the course? And what's the um, worst and what's the second best? And so if we know, so like we, okay, which, if you guys were to look at A, B, and C's lanes, who do you think has like the best lane? And uh, you don't necessarily have to agree with my diagram on the left. <laughs> Hmm. 
today's there. I like it. Yeah. So like we were talking earlier, we know these boats are reaching. And so we know that um, both A and B have clean air. And I would argue that A has the best lane here because they've got clean air and they can jibe when they want to. Um, and so they're not going to be forced to overstand and sail extra distance. And they're not going to be, um, they, can't, they don't have to wait for someone else. And so I would argue A's got the best one and then B has the second best. Uh, C is definitely in some bad air down here. We know because she's either get, he or she's either getting blanketed or in uh, this yellow boat's bad air. So C's in some bad air and pretty stuck down there. And then A and B have clean air, but B has to deal with a lot of traffic once they start jabbing back um, and they might get held out and not able to jive by these other boats. Um, and they're gonna have some starboard boats deal. So I would say A's got the best and then B and then C. Okay, and then let's check it out from the other side. Um, the reason we say this is the best lane uh, is because it's clear air, it's coming in from an edge, and it's clean on ley line. But you can also apply that to like a group when you're coming out of a group. You know, anyone that's like leading the pack on clear air can control their own destiny, you know, and uh, is not overstanding ley line. That's the best position to exit a pack. Now, the second best is to exit early because if you don't exit early and you're not in a position to get the best lane, then you might get stuck either overstood or in bad air. So if we look at this next one, this like number three lane is, it's overstood, so that's bad because that's extra distance and it's likely gonna be in bad air under other boats. Okay, so just some ways to think about that. And then, so how do you get out of a corner? Let's actually stop thinking about this front pack and let's think about this back pack or the middle pack. Okay, so say we're sailing down one of this middle pack and we see that boats are starting to jive. Okay, we know we have to go past their lane because they're in bad air and we're not gonna jive. They're, you know, they create bad air. We don't wanna jive right into their bad air. Um, but whoever is gonna, basically, if you, you know, if you wanna be able to be the first person to jive out of this pack, but oftentimes you're not the only one that wants to jive out, right? So the boat behind you is like, I am gonna wait till they go and I'm gonna jump them. And what jump on means it, to us is that you jive at the same time and basically put yourself between them and their wind and you take their air and you blanket them and you roll them, ruin their day. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> They're just their moment. It's, uh, it's part of the game. So you have to know who's going to jump, who can jump. So that's what we mean by jump is like you're behind and you're going to try to match someone's jive and jive on top of them. So who in this diagram do you think can jump? Who's in a I can jump someone position? If we were going downwind, I'd be like, Steph, we're gonna jump these guys. Actually, sometimes we say matching. C, B. Nice. 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 Totally, you guys are nailing it. Yep. Nice job. And we're getting a lot of, we're trying to trick you with a lot of like, can be more than one answers, but exactly, B or C, because. They're really close behind, right? Especially B is this red boat here. B is really close behind A and a little low on their line. So they've gotten in this really powerful position. And as soon as A wants to jive, B is going to be like, me too. Boom, jive, take the breeze. Okay, so who do you think is on defense then if we've established that B and C are able to jive or able to jump? Yeah, totally. Right. A, A is on defense. A is like, uh-oh, these boats can jump us. So... The next best plan, if they can jump us, <laughs> is to go early. And yeah, you guys are right. B, Margo, good, good call. B is on defense for C. Yep, so A has to defend themselves against B. B's got to defend themselves against C. Okay, so if you know you can get jumped, the answer is to get out early or you're going to get stuck really late. On the ley line. Yeah, on the ley line. And no one likes to be there, right? You always like end up, okay, we're just going to be patient. We're just going to be patient. We're just going to be patient. And then before you know it, we're overstood and we're like, no. So... Yep, think about it this way. If, you can, if the answer is, can we get jumped? Yes, okay, then we gotta look for an early exit. And uh, that's where the second best option comes in, um, is getting out a little bit early so that you know, like B probably knew, okay, I'm not gonna be able to get any of these really good lanes, this lane, and so I'm gonna have to go a little early, otherwise I'm just gonna get stuck going past everyone and down here. Okay, cool. Yeah, so imagine you were, you're this boat here. What would you be thinking? What would you say? You second place boat. Yeah, second place boat. Second blue boat.
watch behind me. Love it. Yep. Yep. Wait to drive out. Totally. Yeah. Be ready. Exactly. Once when first jives, I jive. Nice. Love it. Attack mode. Got to jump one. I like it. Yeah. <laughs> for me before they can match my jive. I'm in a good position. Nice. Love it. Yeah. You guys are looking forwards and backwards. That's awesome. Awesome. Um, and one other thing I wanted to point out is that in our fleet, because we sail such wide angles, so it might be a little bit less exaggerated in your fleet, but it definitely still exists. We call this like the cone of death in the bottom of the course, where you get in, you, you've made a mistake in that you've jibed before you're on a ley line. So if we look at this diagram, blue and red are looking sweet because they are clean air, they're pretty close to this ley line, happy days, they can jive when they want to next. But these ones up here, like, they're fighting for their lane, so they're probably sailing a little extra distance. You know, they can't just sail where they want to sail. They're going to have to either jive before they want to, or, you know, their other boats are basically going to want to jive when they want to jive, which is the ley line. And so um, this is the cone where we don't, we don't like to be in here. And we talk about getting out to an edge, like step out to a ley line before you get stuck in this cone. Um, here's a quick video about how someone gets stuck in the cone. Basically, red and blue are looking sweet, they're looking good, they're clear air, everything's happy. And then I want you to keep an eye on these two boats here, red and green. Did I just pause? Sorry. Going full screen. Guys, speed up. Okay, so um, red has decided I'm either gonna have to follow green in or, uh, you know, and, and be late. So red, I'm sorry, now we're looking at, I want you guys to look at green, pink, red, and yellow. Green, pink, red, and yellow. Green is like, I'm gonna get out here and I'm gonna get out here to this lay line. Pink was like, I'm gonna have to follow green in delay and I wanna go to this other mark. So both of them are taking a hitch out to these ley lines. And I'm gonna try to speed up a little for you guys. And I want to watch, so here, pink crosses just behind pink and in front of green. Okay, so we know where they are. They're just behind, did I say pink? Pink crosses just behind yellow and in front of green. Now pink is down here in this little bit of, little bit of clean air, certainly cleaner than these guys have here. And now they're not quite on ley line. Pink's on a ley line, green's on a ley line. They're doing their second jive. Red's in yellow's bad air. Pink has been sailing free, and pink, uh, I don't wanna, you see pink now has room and is inside of yellow and has gained a lot. Pink just gained by basically saying, I'm gonna get to an edge instead of sailing through this like middle of the cone with someone else. Nice. So Maggie just did like talked a lot about the middle of the course and now we're going to transition into the bottom of the course but before we do does anyone have any questions about kind of that lane management and the cone um, of approaching from an edge that kind of thing any questions my expo does not like to jibe i have to head super high to jibe why hmm are you maybe using too much rudder and not enough body weight that could be possible. Let's, um, Jude, we'll come back to that at the end because I want to make sure we keep trucking forward. That sounds like something we can, we can talk more about at the end. Keep that one, keep that one in mind. Um, how do you avoid the cone of death? We've had a couple questions about that. <laughs> um, Basically, if we go back to this diagram, oops. You want to jibe out and get to a ley line before you get stuck in here. Does it's kind of, it's, you know, it's something that you have to think about in your head. And um, just like, you know, it, you just want to avoid the middle of the course towards the bottom of the, of the run, especially if you're in a lot of traffic. So these boats, for example, are the ones that we were paying attention to are in a lot of traffic. So they came out to the edge so that they could come back um, with clean air. Um, and the one boat that went out to the um, course side right 
came back with starboard tack advantage. So they had, they got to be in the middle. Um, so it's, it's kind of something that's just in your head, but it's thinking um, so that, you know, approaching the gates from the edge so that you have that inside overlap um, is, is a big thought there. And it's also being patient up here and not jibing until you're at an edge. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's like waiting so that you're not going to jive and go back into the middle too soon. <laughs> Good question. Good questions, guys. It's like the starting line. It's the invisible line. <laughs> yeah. Cool. So we've, we wanted to talk, take some time to talk about some, um, some gate roundings. Um, I know you guys use gates in uh, like the inlands and stuff. And there's always that tough choice when you're coming in and you know, okay, the wind has shifted to the right, um, but maybe um, one gate is favored or, you know, there's more pressure one way. And so how do you make that decision? Um, and I really like this diagram because it shows the wind shifts right. And it shows how the boats round at the same time, but the boat, the red boat ends up ahead because they're, they went to the upwind gate. Um, and so choosing that upwind gate is really, and being able to see it and identify it is a really powerful tool. Um, and so, you know, there is, yeah, that leads into our next discussion here of how you actually make that decision. And you guys will notice the emoji on my head there. That's how I feel sometimes when I have to make a decision about which gate to round. Does anyone else feel that way? <laughs> yeah. um, there's a lot of, there's a lot to think about. There's you know, which, what is this, the skew or what's the bias towards one way? Um, what's the, the shift in pressure? Um, and what's the easiest way to get there with the traffic and a maneuver you have to do? Um, and so definitely factoring all these things in. Um, but one thing to look at, or one thing to think about is the sooner you make the decision, the better, because then you can avoid that cone of death. Oftentimes I find that if we are struggling to make a decision, then we end up in that cone of death. So the sooner you can make the decision or the earlier you can make it, the better. Um, and then if, as soon as you make the decision, making sure your crew knows so that they can do their job really well. If you sail on a double handed boat, especially a 420. Um, I know some Margo says she sails 420. So making sure you give your crew enough time to get the kite down and know what um, type of rounding you're doing. Um, and then, um, you have to balance the traffic versus the pressure versus the shift. Um, if there's a favored mark by a considerable amount, like if it's further upwind, um, you, you would aim to, to take that further upwind mark. Um, but if the gates are even, like if you can't really tell a difference with one being closer to you or looking more upwind, then you would take the one that t puts you in the direction that you want to go. Um, and then if it's really shifty and really puffy, you want to think about the gate that will get you into the most amount of pressure. And then you want to immediately get into, into phase, get onto the lift attack. So if we go back to the last scenario, um, red boat came in with a right shift, but they round and they rounded the, the left turn, but then they round onto the headed tack. So they have to, they have to immediately tack in order to get onto the lifted tack. So, the blue boat rounds the unfavored gate, but rounds onto the lift, whereas the red boat rounds the favored gate because it's more upwind, but rounds onto the header. So the important thing there is to remember to get onto the lift attack right away. Steph has a move for this. <laughs> She's got to move for this. It's tough, right? If the buy it, if the favored end is the wrong, is sending you on the wrong right in the wrong direction, it's tough. I was trying to set that up for you. <laughs> yeah, so here we have an example of us sailing in Japan. Um, we're coming down to the leeward mark. You can see us, we're the purple boat. I think we're in like 14th or 15th place. Um, and then there's the, the New Zealand girls there in like, what, seventh or so? Third. Third. Um, so the left-hand <laughs> side of the course in this situation is very, very favored. And we have to go to the left. But as you can see, the gate on the right hand side of the, the screen is quite upwind. So we're, as we're coming down, we, we downwind Maggie and I are talking, we see that that gate is very favored, but we wanna go to the left. So we're saying, okay, how do we make this, this plan? Um, and so our thought here is to round the favored gate 
but then tack right away so that we're heading towards the favorite side of the course. Nice, Margo says round and tack. Nailed it, Margo. Oh, boom. <laughs> so you guys can see here, we come in um, and we're in 14th place. We're looking to gain a couple boats to get into a top 10 position. So we come to that mark, we round the mark. We're still coming in here. Can you speed that up a little bit, Maggie? Mm-hmm. I'm gonna say that to you sometime. <laughs> I'll speed it up a little bit. <laughs> All right, so here we go for the left-hand turn. And you can see like all these boats that rounded the other, the other gate are fight, they want to go left, but they're in a really bad lane to make it happen. So here we round um, that, the left mark looking downwind, and then we tack right away, and we have a really good lane heading out to the favored side of the course. And over time, you'll see that we, we gained quite a bit on those girls that were, um, you know, we went from 14th to 10th here and gained a lot. We've got one of the biggest lanes, meaning like no one is directly to lure of us. So we're able to put the bow down and we're doing eight knots up here while they're doing like six and a half knots down here. Well, yep, we're doing eight knots and they're doing seven. We're doing eight knots. And so the fact that they're all pinching down there because they, you know, they all wanted the same thing is uh, slow for them. Cool. Does anyone have any questions on how to make a lured gate choice? <laughs> I'm sure you all can relate to that emoji. Sorry. So definitely think about that upwind gate. If the upwind gate allows you to round and tack right away or um, gives you into more pressure, always take that one. Um, if there's, and then the other thing to think about is the traffic as well. So if you're sailing at like the inlands or you're sailing at the Opti Nationals or something like thinking about where the traffic is, especially if you're ahead, looking back and saying, whoa, there's a lot of boats coming down this one side of the race course. I might avoid that side of the race course so I can sail in more clear air. Cool. Okay. Now we're going to get into some fun stuff. <laughs> yeah. Quick, quick, quick. We're going to do rapid fire review of lure mark rules. So it's basically um, the same thing as windward mark, but we just flip it and reverse it and then think about it going downwind. <laughs> so three bowling zone, overlap still matters, just the same as the windward, windward mark. Um, but we want to show you, okay, here's a, here's a fancy diagram because I found, we all know green is overlap inside red because the way you determine overlap is by drawing an imaginary line from someone's transom and extends forever and ever and ever. And so basically greens inside that overlapped zone right there. So green would have, when ha would have mark room on this mark. Whereas over here, red heads up a little bit, no overlap, that's a very close call, but green is technically not overlapped inside. So when red touches the zone, no room, no bueno. All right, we wanna show you a cool video of the last downwind, or the, sorry, the first downwind of the medal race of our last world championships. Because some crazy stuff happened at this Lord Mark and we didn't know it at the time, but we watched the live stream later. And we we're like, what was going on? Mm -hmm. it, was, it was a lot windier actually than it looks. It looks like really nice, but it was probably 18 to 22 or so. And there was this big right shift that that's us with the yellow spinnaker, like almost capsizing. <laughs> Steph got hit by the spinnaker. It was kind of chaos. Uh, so Steph had to like pull the protest flag out. And that's why there's no, but what I want you to actually watch is on this left-hand mark. So after Denmark and Germany round, keep an eye on this left-hand mark. Spain is who we're thinking about. Spain 23 with the They're blue kite. taking down spinnaker. that blue spinnaker. Yep. And so Spain's like weaving her way through these boats, which is kind of crazy. And then France comes flying in. Netherlands is like, what's happening? So keep an eye on Spain. Keep looking at what Spain's doing. Huh. Do, 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 do. All right. So let's talk about what Spain just did there and what we think is legal and, and okay. Here is that race, but it's, um, I pulled it up on the tracker because I think it's harder to keep track of, it's, yeah, it's confusing to keep track of everybody from that drone angle. Okay, and here comes Spain trucking in at 14 knots. <laughs> They're slowing down, but it did look like that. <laughs> okay, so now Spain is weaving through these two upwind boats. See that, the two upwind boats that they're going, she's going through have, have rounded the mark. Sorry, guys. Foiled again. Bear with me. 
That was so anticlimactic. Okay. Go full screen. I'm not going to stop it. Okay. Spain's coming back in. So Spain goes through these boats that are going upwind. And then France and Netherlands are coming into the picture. Looks like they're all going to round this left mark. And then, whoop, nope. Yeah, Spain changes her mind. Goes the other way. <laughs> they almost got their heads chopped off. <laughs> yes. Yeah, it was kind of crazy. Super crazy. OK. So that was tracking. And now you'll see some screenshots. I want you guys to be the judge. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Computer frozen. <laughs> Woo, here we go. Try this again. OK, so here's the question. Do you think, oh my gosh. <laughs> there we go. Do you think Spain is fouling France and Netherlands were those two boats right outside her? So what do you guys think? <laughs> head, her head is still on, I promise. <laughs> so Everyone is OK. <laughs> think about it for a sec. What do you guys think that Spain fouled France and Netherlands? No, OK. Yes, proper course. Okay. Yes, from Zach. No, are you sure? Okay, I love it. <laughs> hey, guys, everyone was confused by this. We actually had a great call with the US sailing team, and every, we were all confused. And Dave Perry was like, the consensus is that there may have, this may have exposed a loophole in the rules, but that we don't think rules were broken. So let me tell you, tell you more. Okay, what about now? Do you think Spain has fouled France at this point? Does it change anything? So France was the one that was uh, on port. Netherlands, the green boat was on starboard, and this is Spain just getting across her bow. Okay, so we think there are some fouls going on. Some people think there is not. Okay, and then this third situation shows you that these two mark then continue rounding this way, and then Spain carries over. No collision. That's true. There was no collision that we know of. Okay, so oh, you're not done yet. <laughs> I'm gonna go back to the rules real quick. First rule that I think is relevant was when Spain's going in and out of those other boats that are going upwind. Um, it's a good question, Margo, but just uh, here, bear with me. So, um, <laughs> That's a lot of tests. sorry, sorry. Uh, I can go like this and re represent. Okay. Um, okay. Okay. Between a mark, okay, 18, mark room does not apply between a boat that's approaching a mark and one's leaving it. So the boats that had rounded the mark when we're going back upwind are on starboard. Spain was on port, weaving her way through, doing her crazy thing. No collisions, none of the starboard boats had to avoid, so no foul there. It's just something to keep in mind. There's no rule 18 situation with boats that have rounded and boats that are going to round. Okay, so next, next thing we go on to. When boats are overlapped, the outside boat shall go to the inside boat mark room. Okay, so we know Spain was overlapped inside both France and Netherlands, so Spain gets room on that mark. Okay, so Spain gets room on that mark. We know that. All right, cool. That's 18.2a. So then we keep reading about when she's, uh, blah, blah, blah. She hasn't left the zone yet when they're, you know, when they're all next to each other, so it's all fine. She's getting room. They're giving her room. All right, cool. 18.4 is interesting. So when an inside overlapped right-of-way boat must jive at a mark to sail her proper course. So pause there, that would be Spain, right? Because she was inside an overlap and right-of-way on France, who was also on port. Okay, so this rule says, until she jives, she shall sail no further from the mark that needed to sail that course, blah, blah, blah. That means if you have to jive around the mark, you can't go farther from the mark and then jive. You have to basically just jive immediately and round it. But then we keep reading and it gets really crazy. But 18.4, this rule we're talking about, does not apply at a gate mark. So the rule that says if you're rounding a mark and there's only one mark and you and you get room to like jive and round it, you can't take more room than you're entitled to jive and round it. That applies if there's one mark. If there are two marks, it doesn't apply. And it's just a windward lured situation. So if we go back to France, here, all is okay. Spain is inside boat. She gets mark room on these two boats. She's lured on France. France is keep clear. Okay, and then France has mark room on Netherlands, who's on starboard. So France gets to take her room to round the mark, and Netherlands has to keep clear because it's a, it's a rule 18 situation between them. Okay, and then we get to this point. This is where it gets weird. 
you'd think Spain has gone farther and hasn't followed a proper course, right? And so she should jibe. She has to jibe and round the mark. But rule 18.4, the last one I just told you about, says that if it's a gate, you don't have to jibe there and you can keep sailing and choose to go to the other mark. Um, but that does mean if you're not taking room, that then you don't have any protection of the mark room rule and now you're just a port boat. And so the fact that she just sneaks past another one's bow here, who's on starboard, makes it all okay. Does that make sense? Had she not, you know, if another one's had to avoid or had there been a contact between this port and starboard boat here, Spain would not have been, not have been clear. But because she does not have to jive there because 18.4 says she doesn't have to jive because it's a gate. And because she's inside and lured and, and, you know, she, and then she crosses the starboard boat and goes to the other mark, all was okay. So the answer we learned was that Spain had not fouled. I would not necessarily recommend that you guys round marks like that, but <laughs> I thought it uh, exposed an interesting part of the rules. So any questions? That was, that was cool. It was a lot of different levels because, you know, ultimately we have to think when we are approaching the lured mark, um, do we have mark room? Do we... Um, uh, are we overlapped? And so, you know, this just brings it to a whole new level um, with different rules scenarios that you can encounter out there. Um, show us that video again. Which one, drone video? So Spain also, after this crazy Lord Mark rounding, went on to win the gold medal at the World Championships. Pretty impressive. Tamara Eshigoyen and Paula Barcelo. So that's us there with the yellow kite almost wiped out. Those are our competitors right behind us. We have this like weird sloppy rounding. <laughs> Steph doesn't have the main sheet in her hand because she had to fly a red flag. Okay, here's the good stuff. Craziness. <laughs> so Spain and Netherlands here, by the way, who both were like, what is everyone doing, you crazies? They both just footed around all the chaos and got these sweet lanes. <laughs> so just do keep that in mind that that's an option too. What happened on our downwind? Um, what happened on our downwind? Uh, basically, we are here in this yellow, yellow kites there, and this boat here is uh, on the, the German boat, they jibe onto starboard and then we had to avoid them. Like right now they're starting to jibe and we basically had to avoid them. We almost capsized in doing so. The reason so many people got overstood though is that there's a, um, a big right shift and a puff. So we went from being like a little overstood to very overstood. And when I say like very overstood, that means we're like reaching in and almost capsizing. Um, and the puff, really just complicated matters I think and and you can just see it it kind of catches everyone off guard and that's why it looks like <laughs> the metal race is almost capsizing <laughs> and Mrs. Porter comments that we yes we went on to win the race after this it was a pretty crazy race <laughs> so maybe this gets you guys a little bit excited to come try out the 49ers sometime we'd love to have have you guys come try the boat out um, and I want to get back to Ju's question. Um, my expo does not like to jibe. I have to head up super high to jibe. Why? Um, and just, I just wanted to clarify, um, is this before or after the jibe that you have to head up super high? Before. Um, so I think if that's the reason, then you might not have enough speed before the jive. So um, if you feel like you have to head up, um, then you might not have enough speed. Um, so making sure before the jive that your boat has um, a lot of speed. So that would be, if I were to make like a mental checklist for jiving, it would be, okay, do I have enough speed? Okay, yes, I have enough speed. Um, and then, does my crew know if you're sailing well in an expo? Yes, you have to let your crew know. And then 
once you make sure you have those two things that you're making a nice smooth turn that you're you're carving away slowly from the wind and then pulling pulling the boom across as you come as as you do that turn through dead downwind um, and then the most of, a really important part of that whole process is hitting the right exit angle so you think about that nice carve downwind and then hitting a good exit angle to build that speed again so it's really all about speed and i would say if you're having to head up a lot before the jive that you're not getting enough speed um, before you do the maneuver Maggie, do you have anything to add to that no i, I was curious about um when you say it doesn't like to jive, do you just mean that you have to use a lot of rudder or that it's very slow or that it doesn't happen soon enough? Because I think um, if you could clarify that part of it, it could help us a little more. But I do agree with what Steph is saying. Maybe you have to trim the main to kind of encourage it to come over mm -hmm. um, slow and long. Yeah. Yeah. I'm not an expo, uh, <laughs> I'm not an expo expert, but I also think, yeah, using your body weight to steer the boat could help it yeah. a little bit. Yeah, and I think that's a really, well, as we said earlier, we're going to get into some, into speed for upwind and downwind next week, which we're really excited about with you guys. Um, but definitely as far as a boat handling um, concept, like making sure that you're not using a ton of, of rudder um, and not doing a sharp turn, especially when you're driving. You want to make a smooth, slow carve down. And like Maggie said, using your weight to help steer the boat. So if you hear, feel the boat to windward, the boat's going to carve down. If you heel the boat to leeward, the boat's going to turn up towards the wind. So using the, the heel of the boat to help the turn, and then also making sure you have enough speed and a nice smooth turn um, down through the down um, downwind. So hopefully that helps. Um, feel free to reach out to us again if you have more questions or you have some video that you would like us to look at. We'd love to help you guys out. Um, Thanks for bearing with us. Yeah, any it's other hard. Questions? Some concepts are just hard to talk about over a computer <laughs> <laughs> or telltales. <laughs> that was some great material, you guys. Thanks so much. Uh, really exciting to see that uh, video approaching the mark and, and uh, just to think about all the things that are going on in a case like that. Rules, uh, different boats at different speeds, etc. So.